Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you again. Are you ready for this? It's a little different than normal, I think. Anyway, we'd like to welcome you to the Reed and Christine Halliday Executive Lecture Series. Today, we enthusiastically welcome Mr. Tom Dixon, founder and CEO of Blendtec. Uh, long before the Will It Blend series exploded on YouTube, Tom Dixon was blending two by twos with his blenders to determine their capability. As an engineer and an inventor, Tom grew up putting big engines in little things. His professional entrepreneurial career started in 1971 at the age of 25. From experimenting with sending hard wheat through a vacuum, Tom produced the kitchen mill and revolutionized the home grain milling business. This eight pound mill produced flour twice as fast and twice as fine than its 60 pound predecessor, the stone mill. His innovations didn't stop with one success. As an inventor, Tom Tom's drive to simplify people's lives helped him design an all-in-one kitchen machine with a mixer and a blender built in with only a 12-inch footprint. This machine was a great success as it could mix four times as much dough as its closest comparison. Because the blender on this mix and blend outperformed most commercial blenders at the time, this drove Tom to further improve on this platform to create one of his finest inventions to date, the Total Blender. Since the early 90s, when there was a need for a high power blender in a smoothie shop, Tom has continued to improve on his new invention. As an engineer, Tom has been blending crazy things in his blender for years. Five years ago this month, in October 2006, some of Tom's extreme blends were captured on video and they became a viral sensation. Since then, Tom has become a celebrity with his wacky extreme blending videos seen on willitblend.com and YouTube. Get this, viewed by over one half billion people all over the world, Tom has become an icon and has been featured on many local and national news and entertainment programs, newspapers, magazines, and blogs. Tom is still innovating, continues to sit on multiple boards, and has received many accolades and awards for his inventions. Blendtec today has over 250 employees and is a privately held company. Blendtec is the leading manufacturer of innovative blending and dispensing equipment, which is used daily in homes and in the most prestigious restaurants and smoothie shops around the world. If you've ever had a smoothie from a high-powered blender, odds are you've tasted one of Blendtec's uh, technological advances. Tom believes in education. He doesn't believe that any challenge is too hard and is always seeking to find innovative solutions to everyday problems. Uh, to be here to speak to us this morning, Tom flew in from a European media trip, landing at about 2 o'clock this morning, and still found time and energy to come down and be here with us today. That's kind of the formal introduction. One of the things I'd like to mention in my brief visit with Tom this morning is just how impressed I am with what he's doing right here in the United States in Orem, Utah, with manufacturing, with his employees, and supporting them in their growth. And I don't know if he'll have a chance to visit with you about that at all. If not, we'll find a time when, when someone from his organization will. But this is an individual who cares deeply about making things better and about helping people make themselves better. Uh, put your hands together, if you would, for Tom Dixon. Now, how many of you have not seen me on the internet? Yes! Good for you. And shame on the rest of you for wasting your time watching this stuff. <laughs> no, we have, a, we have a great time. I, I, got, I got both um, extremes. I was in, I just, just got back from London, and uh, a, a, a gentleman that I was on the uh, train with going to Heathrow, uh, he was so excited to see me, and uh, he was on his way to Germany, and he, and he said, he said, oh, if it wasn't for you, I would have never made it through college, because every time I needed to chill out and watch a minute and a half video, he says, I during finals and everything, I'd always watch Will It Blends. Now that's one extreme. In Scotland on Saturday, the manager of the restaurant said, the rest of the hotel said, man, Will It Blend almost caused me to fail college. He said, we're all getting around together. We're, all we did is watch Will It Blend. So it was one of the worst things. We loved it, but it sure detracted from our education. <laughs> so there's the extremes. But Stay away from TV, stay away from stuff that doesn't really do you any good. Work hard. And, uh, but I've had a real struggle. How many of you are ADHD? Oh, come on. 
not very many, what's wrong? <laughs> and how many of you are dyslexic? Few. How many of you are ADHD and dyslexic? Anybody? Stand up. Nobody. I'm just, you know, I was in front of um, Heritage School up by the mouth of the canyon, and there's people here from all over the, the uh, U.S. Not one person, not one student from Utah, though. And I asked that question, and you would not believe how many. There are about, uh, what, 200, Tim? Something like that. And their parents were there. And what a group. And I really felt at home with that group because there's so many that, that even there's probably a dozen that were ADHD and dyslexic. But you'll find when you have these challenges, whether they're physical or psychological or whatever's wrong with you, it's a real blessing. I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have these defects what some people call defects. I went through, I went through school, never missed a day of, of grade school or high school, and I read two books. One was T-Model Tommy and one was Bulldozer. And I think my mother read T-Model Tommy to me, but I, I know for sure I read Bulldozer a couple times. But those are the only two books I read in 12 years. I just couldn't read, I couldn't deal with school, period. I had a real tough time. And then, in fact, I took, at one school in San Francisco, I was born in San Francisco, grew up in the Bay Area, and I went to two different schools. And I went to one school, my regular school, and I took, I, all of my classes had a little R, world background R, English R. Everything said R for retard, or actually remedial. And every class, and they just want to kind of scoot us through, you know. And I had really good grades. In fact, with a, with, in the one school with, with a machine shop class and in another school, Sequoia High School, I took three hours of shop. And there I really is where my entrepreneurial career really got started because we had an incredible shop. Um, and, and I could, we did all the projects. I'd get the people, at, the students that really wanted to work. And we would um, do all the projects for the year in two weeks. And then we started making motorcycle parts after, after uh, market motorcycle parts and, and her shifters and so on. And, and I would pay these guys and I'd sell them at the motorcycle shop where I worked and also uh, um, in other areas. But that's where I started making money. I'd slip a little money off to these guys and they learned how to do some, some real viable things. But then it came time to graduate. My dad was a, a machinist at Hewlett Packard, tool and die maker, and worked right for Dave and Bill in 1951, Hewlett and Packard. And uh, so I had a, a job there. And so it's, now it's time to graduate. And my counselor, D. Kent, said, so Tom, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, I'm going to go to college. And of course, she said, whoa, because she thought I was going to go do this um, machine shop thing, this, uh, this uh, um, apprenticeship machine shop tool and die thing at Hewlett Packard. I said, no, I'm going to go to college. Where are you going to go to college? I'm going to go to Brigham Young University in Utah. And the first thing that came out of her mouth was, they won't let you in Brigham Young University. And I said, really? Ken Woolley said they would. Now, Ken Woolley was a valedictorian. He was the president of the class, and he was the pole vaulter, and everybody knew Ken Woolley, and he was going to be my roommate. I said, he's going to help me. He's going to be my roommate. And she said, but what are you going to study? And I said, engineering. She said, you can't study engineering. You haven't had any math. I said, yes, I have. I was in your sophomore general math class. She said, but you failed. I said, no, I didn't. I got a D minus. <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't know that I did some trig two days a week in, at the other high school. I learned trig. I thought that was a very valuable bunch of math. And so that really helped. And it helped me at BYU. But it was a struggle. I mean, this is horrible. But I went to BYU for a year and a half with a 1.7 GPA. And I worked hard with, with studies. And uh, I had saved up enough money. I paid for my own school. And then, um, in fact, after my first year, my, um, my dad and, and a best friend um, died in my arms. 
<laughs> this, I said this, I got a little emotional with this group at the Heritage School, and they say anything at any time, and this, this guy in the, in the front row said, what's wrong, Tom, did you forget your cue cards? <laughs> and so it was great, because it lightened me up, you know, I didn't have to. <laughs> so Tim just said, you forget your cue card, and then halfway through, another guy back in the back, when I got, got a little emotional, <laughs> he said something, but anyhow. so. I had quite a I had quite a struggle, and uh, and then um, through school, and then I said, okay, and I'm starting to get a little religion, and I said, you know, I got to go on a mission, so I went on a I served a mission, and uh, which is the best thing ever, because then I could come back and I was really mature. I did have some problems because I, without being able to read well. Um, I got. I had to memorize everything, which was a real blessing because I can probably outquote any of you here on pages and, and 138 different sections of scripture and stuff because I had to memorize everything because I can't read in front of people, and I got caught once because I had the scriptures upside down, and <laughs> and the people said, "What's wrong with your book?" And because I have everything memorized, and I just go like I'm reading, and I can look up and do all this stuff like I know how to read. And I said, oh, they thought it was printed wrong or something. I said, no, I'm dyslexic. I can read upside down just like right side up. And so, you know, <laughs> so I got through that all right. But anyhow, it was a great experience and came back to BYU and, and got married and so on and, and survived. It took me five years. To uh, to make it through uh, through engineering, but then uh, this is in '71, and there weren't very many jobs, and so and I had to, the other thing I was 50 on the lottery, and can now now keep in mind this is my mentor, who also served a mission in in England. I was just in fact at the mission home two days ago where he was, and um, and he's a mission president in Moscow today, but here he is. Um, he's now going to Stanford. He graduated from BYU in physics in, in three and a half years, number one in the class, and now he's going to Stanford, getting his MBA and PhD concurrent and teaching two days a week at Cal State Hayward. That's the kind of, so he, uh, he, he went to a draft counselor. I was 50 on the lottery. And so that meant I'm going to Vietnam. So, I th so his wife said, oh, Tom likes trucks. Let's sign him up in a National Guard unit in, San, in uh, San Bruno, California. So I ended up going back to California. Jobs are hard to find. I had the first resume and last that I've ever done. And I handed it to a headhunter who was looking for a, an engineer. And she took one look at this and said, you got to be kidding. You know, you are a missionary. You have two kids. I, you know, what's wrong with that? And she threw, threw the resume away, last time I ever saw a resume, and she said, hand me a piece of paper and a pen, and she said, list the equipment that you're familiar with that you can operate that has to do with fabricating plastics. And so I made a list of vacuum forming and injection molding and extruding and all that stuff that I'd done at BYU. And then I got the job, I got the job offer, which was like three bucks an hour. I mean, it was, it was $700 a month. And uh, I said, you know, I just can't do that. And then, then they raised it to 750, and uh, so I, okay, I can do that. And uh, anything, I need a job. And so um, I went to work for the inventor of the birth control pill, Alejandro Zaffaroni. And and um, and the the letters came from the first two letters of his two names. And he was a South American medical doctor. I was a 24th employee there, and. They, everybody I worked with were all doctors. I mean, everything from veterinarians to OB doctors to ophthalmologists, they were all doctors. I was the first non-doctor kind of person in the company and the first hands-on person. And so um, the, we grew very rapidly. In fact, in four and a half years, we grew to 650 employees, huge. And so I built a nice engineering department. I was head of engineering. I had $100 million to spend with no excuses for not performing because I could hire as many people as I want. I could buy anything I wanted. And, and it, was, it was a great learning experience. Keep your day job if you can for a while till you figure it out. But I made the first patch. You know, people wear motion sickness patches, the scopolamine patch. I made the first patch within six months after I left BYU. And uh, in fact, the first one was actually made out of, out of stainless steel, and we actually perforated the, 
outer layer of the skin. Later we found that you could just put the, the um, device on and it would per permeate the, the uh, epidermis. But then also the, uh, the, I, the only IUD that's been on the interuterine device that's been on the market for the last almost 40 years now, when the Tatum T, Copper 7, Dalcon Shield all taken off the market because of perforation and expulsion, they had an expulsion rate of about 40% and the Progesta Cert was like 8%. So they were all taken off except the Progesta Cert, which is still on the market today. But the concept was the release of drug through permeable plastic membranes. And so you take a day and a half Okay, I'm going too slow. Day and a half worth of um, um, oral hormone, which would be uh, for birth control pill, put it in the, in the uterus, it lasts for two years. And so that along with an ocular insert, instead of putting drops in your eye every, every, um, um, every three hours or so, you could put this under your, like a, like a, uh, like a um, uh, lens and, uh, contact lens, it's flexible, and elliptical shape, put it under your lower eyelid, and it would, it would release 20 or 40 micrograms per hour over a week. So these are some of the devices. Um, and, and of course, now you see Nicoderm's out, and Alza sold out and, um, to Johnson & Johnson. But anyhow, very successful company. But I was very impatient, and people in the San Francisco Bay Area were storing wheat in plastic buckets. And so the problem is, when a high humidity area, the uh, gases and moisture go through the bucket and, and it becomes infested with weevil. And so I thought there's got to be a way to, to uh, package uh, foodstuffs uh, for people who are doing long-term long storage. And so I came up with some packaging devices. I was still at Alza. I ordered in, a, I had a truckload of wheat coming in to package and my stuff that I built in my garage. And I sucked up some wheat in my wife's vacuum cleaner, blew it out into a pillowcase and thought, wow, that's interesting. It broke it all up. It wasn't what I wanted to do, but it was a real breakthrough to me because I ran it through a dozen times, and every time I ran it through, I put a, put a sample in a baby food bottle. I had a dozen baby food bottles, and every time it went through, it got finer, dirtier, but finer. And so I thought, wow, if you could take a, a $10 motor and you could do what these big behemoths mills, stone and, and burr mills are doing, this would be a major breakthrough. And so I pursued that. I was still at Alza. I designed a, a rotor and stator, which I'll show you in a second. And that was able to, um, it was a major breakthrough in, uh, in milling. In fact, let me, uh, okay. All right. So this is the, this is the, uh, and I was still at Alza when I designed this. And this is a rotor and this is a stator. Now most mills run it at uh, 1700 RPM, less than 2000 RPM. A vacuum cleaner motor goes at 28,000 RPM. So what happened is by, I machined these, I bought them, I, I set up a, the place I was doing this uh, food storage business. And, and of course my heart was not in food storage anymore. And, and I, I tell you, and that was a very successful company because the first Saturday, everything we packaged in two hours was sold off the walls. So that was a very successful startup and in the San Francisco Bay Area, I sold everything I could package, I could sell, and I was here, I'm still working at Alza. And so, and, but my heart's really into gray mills. And so what I did is I, uh, I machined these out of aluminum, and I made them, even out of aluminum, I made them such that you could put hard popcorn through, and they would hold up just fine. The problem is, they would, I could not find any foundry in this country or in the world that could make these two parts. So I got with a friend of mine from BYU who ran the foundry program there, and I said, Larry, come on out and help me one summer set up this foundry. And so we put in California Precision Casting, and we were able to manufacture these parts. And within, now, and here's a finance problem, because here I am, I got a job, I've got, I've got a year's supply of of everything, food and money, and I got it made. I can feed my wife and at the time, you know, a few children um, off from that. But I'm going to need to develop this mill $350,000. Now, to our money today, that's $1.7 million. And so how am I going to get this money to start this business so I can, so I can do this? And so 
One, I got Magic Mill in Salt Lake City, Utah, because here they sell, they're the best marketing company, but they, and they made a great mill, and it was $350, and a big wooden box with big stones and all that stuff, and they went nuts when they saw this. And this stores in its own pan. In fact, the pan it was in was this high, so I went to them with a stainless steel pan and this mill in it prototype mill and, and it, their jaw just dropped. They had to have it. So I entered into a two-year contract. Now, this was tough negotiating because they left a blank. I'll never forget this. They had a legal size paper and they had a blank at the top. And we got, we settled on $80 that I was going to sell them the mill for and they were selling it for $240. And so they, um, and of course they didn't tell me what they're going to sell for, but they beat me down to the $80, and there's some real story behind that, because a guy that was doing business with them, the Bosch guy, um, said, watch out for these guys, and it was a miracle. I walked into, I was in Chicago at a houseware show, and I walked up to this guy face to face, and never met him before, and, and, and I started talking to him, and I found out he worked for Bosch, and he's the one that sold the Bosch mixer to Magic Mill in Salt Lake City. And he said, watch out for these guys. He took me like a son and said, be careful. These guys are master negotiators and they're just going to beat you up. So you need to start it at $100 and they're going to offer you $60. And wherever you want to end up, make sure you, you, know, you, you stick to that. And don't sign a long-term contract with them. I mean, here he is selling them boshes, but he's, don't tell anybody. And so... So he um, was so helpful, I, I, a long story, but um, so we negotiated back and forth with these folks, $80. And then, um, so I got them to prepay for $100,000 worth of mills. And so that, that locked up the, the contract. And by the way, they wanted a 12-year contract. I didn't understand inflation. And, uh, and I said, no, I don't feel good about that. We're going to put a two on that little blank. And so it ended up being two years. Well, during the first year of that two-year contract, Rob Malincrod, an attorney in, in, in Salt Lake, who's a wonderful person, very good friend of mine now, he went through and he figured out how to circumvent my patent. And, and what he came up with, he says, well, you can't have a big tooth like this in the middle and little teeth on the outside because Tom's got a patent on that. All your teeth have to be the same size. So they made all the teeth the same size and they introduced the Magic Mill 3. This was the Magic Mill 2. They introduced the Magic Mill 3. And if you ran 15 pounds of popcorn through it, it would blow up. It'd bend all the teeth over. So that didn't work. So then they went by, and by the way, these stone and burr mills run at over 200 degrees and do enzymatic damage to the, to the flour. And the, the kitchen mill, or the Magic Mill 2, 130 degrees. And so was theirs 130 degrees until it blew up. And, and so then they put burrs in the middle here and burr here, brought it back up to 200 degrees. It was a big failure, and that was their Magic Mill 3 Plus. After eight months, they introduced that. Anyhow, they sued me for $800,000 saying the mill was no good because they realized, and then they realized the patent was in my name, and they sued me, they sued me and my wife personally for $800,000. And so we had a great attorney, Howard W. Hunter's son, in, in, the, in, the San Francisco, in the San Jose area. And they had some good attorneys here in Utah. But we finally um, went our separate way. So that was my first experience, my first, and I ran out of money. And I had to represent myself in depositions and everything else. As, uh, and that, it was great because then they knew they weren't going to run me out of money because I didn't have any more. And, uh, but that turned out to be okay. And then we moved to Utah because two things happened. One, I'd given stock, and be careful when you put your company together someday, don't, and, and drag it out. You work for somebody else as long as you can, learn everything you can about business, and then finally find your niche. But I, um, I had, uh, don't give away too much stock. Now, the, the way I got the, the, the $100,000 is uh, I pre-sold. Mills. Another hundred thousand dollars came from some folks that um, I gave them twenty percent of the company, and then and then I had all this money in the bank. And this friend of mine came up, and he said, "Hey, can I borrow some money?" And I got this money sitting there doing nothing, 
And so I said, yeah, sure. He was trying to pay off an apartment complex that he had with a bunch of other guys. And so later I found out that, oh, this guy's doing oil shale deals in Vernal, and he's a, math, he's a, a high school math teacher. But he's, got, he's selling lots in Vernal to do oil shale where you can put your trailer house there. And anyhow, I found out about all this later, and they said, you know, you're not going to get your money back. And so, and here I loaned this guy, I don't know, 140000 or something like that. But he went into Hibernia Bank in San Jose. And he said, look at this. And they said, where'd you get the money? Because this guy was going out of business. I mean, they're going to lose this apartment complex. He says, oh, there's this really cool company. They're going to make grain mills. And it's, a, it's growing, and it's, it's going like crazy. And so they had no commercial loans in the South Bay Area, only in San Francisco. So they came to meet with me. And they said, how much money do you need? I said, 150000 and And they said, oh, yeah, no problem. And as it turned out, it cost, uh, and they didn't have me guarantee anything. No personal guarantee, no real property, nothing. This is 150000 And I didn't quite make it. I was 10000 short. And I went back and I said, can I borrow another 10000 They said, yes. And so I borrowed the money, and then I paid them back. By the way, this gentleman, um, uh, Brother Williams, paid me back just fine. And right back, he did a good job. I paid Hibernia Bank back in seven months, totally out of debt. We sold 43,000 mills um, in two years, the first two years of business, before they copied the, the uh, technology. OK, going too slow. <laughs> OK, anyhow, so that's the mill. That started off. And then we wanted to compete with Bosch because um, and by the way, moved to Utah. We put in six stores within a half a mile of, of Magic Mill's most successful stores. Six months later, they filed for bankruptcy. So that was the end of Magic Mill. And then I figured, we need a mixer. So we develop a mixer that's four times the, the capacity of a KitchenAid and, and uh, much better than a Bosch, twice the speed, much, twice the power. And I put a computer in it so it senses the gluten development and shuts off when it's perfectly developed. So this was a major breakthrough. But what turned out to be the real blessing is that I put, an, I put a, a jar on it. You got a high-speed motor? Let's build a jar. And the problem is everybody else's jars cost, the molds cost $80,000 to make, and the Vitamix jar cost $112,000 to make. And one mold company in the US made all of the molds for these different people. I, ha I went to my CPA, he said, you don't have any money. You got $40,000 maximum to build a jar. So I thought, how can I build a jar for $40,000? Because what the mold does is it comes apart like this, and then it comes apart at the handle, because the handle comes back around and touches the jar. So it has to come apart both ways, so it's a four-part mold. And so I came up with this design where it just comes apart, and there's the jar with two parts of the mold, $40,000 made in the USA. And so, and the cool thing is, we didn't realize, because I'm trying to sell this to people at home, that you can stack the jars. You can nest them one in another. So this is the first nesting jar, and I got a patent on that. And so what happened is people started using our mixer, and of course we plugged up the hole where the bowl goes on. This was our first blender. So people started using it commercially, and I thought, oh, you think that's good? I can build a real commercial blender. So I built the first in-the-counter blender, the first blender with a, a sound enclosure, and automatic program speed. So everybody wants to copy us. So Howard Schultz, founder of, of Starbucks, sat on Jamba's board, who later m merged with Zuka here in Utah, and they, they had to have a better blender. Of course, they came to us. They said, but we don't know. You know, Hamilton Beach, Waring, Vitamix, are all coming out with blenders just like yours, with quiet boxes, cycles, and everything. I said, look, why don't you, and they only, they're in San Luis Obispo, California. They had, they, they had 11 stores, and they wanted exclusivity. No, that's not going to happen. But they, um, I said, look, give me a nickel. They didn't have any money to buy blenders. I said, give me a nickel every time you do a blend. And so they said, OK, we can do that. And so I gave them all the blenders, all the jars, everything they needed. And then after they had 326 stores, 336 stores, and they're doing 50 million cycles a year, and I lowered them to three cents a cycle, they were um, um, very happy with what we're doing. And then 
I thought they, the, the, the operators would always miss portion. And so what happened is I developed a new jar. Now what they, um, the, the wooden cavitate. Cavitation, you probably all experienced it, is when the, the blade goes around and it forms, you put too much solid, not enough liquid, you have a cavity around the blade and nothing happens. So I thought, I can solve that problem. So one Labor Day weekend, I cut up a bunch of these jars on a Friday night and Saturday glued them together and it leaked like a sieve. This is, a, this is one, this is actually right out of the courtroom. It's got an evidence number on it, an exhibit number. But anyhow, I, I, and this is a mock-up, and this is a, the reason this is a mock-up is because when we tested it on Tuesday, after I, I invented it, it blew up. So this is not the original. Um, and then we, we built it up so it wouldn't blow up. And, and anyhow, you'll see this has a three inch blade in it, 270 mile tip speed, mile an hour tip speed. The, the uh, wild side jar is what we call it, has a four inch blade. So no matter what you put in this, very rarely is it ever gonna cavitate. So Jamba went nuts. All the smoothie companies went nuts over this. This is the jar and the wild side jar. And what Jamba, the, what, what Vitamix did is they went to Jamba and said, we will do your blends for two cents. And, and uh, Jamba said, okay, we'll do that if you'll give us a jar that performs like the Blendtec Wildside jar. And they said, no problem. Now keep in mind, Vitamix, there's a Vitamix jar. That's the jar that the mold cost. You see how the mold has to come apart and so on. They got a little crisscross. Everybody's got a crisscross blade. I have a patent on a single blade with the winglets on the tips. And so this is what they have, and they have to have a plunger to cram stuff down. That's what Vitamix had commercially. Can you imagine doing milkshake at Baskin Robbins or Hagen Doss and laying that puppy on the table with all the drippies and, and they get all cut up in Baskin Robbins and, and uh, bacteria grows up inside that plunger? Bad thing. And so what they did is they copied my jar. That's the copy. And so you see a little similarities, exactly the same height, everything's the same. You can lose, use lids interchangeably, single blade, winglets on the tips. So they copy the blade, the jar. And so finally, now this is the 30th thing. They've copied over 30 things that we've done. They do 160 million a year in sales. Two years ago, Vitamix was very effective marketing company, but a poor engineering company. They had 11 engineers to our 30 engineers. Of course, they got, they got 50 marketing people to our hardly any. We'll talk about that in a second, but um, that's where, anyhow, we'll talk about that. Now, so we brought them, we went to court with them. The judge was able to double the damages to 40 to $24.1 million. So that's the award. Now, the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, 10 times in a row, has validated all 38 claims of my two patents on this jar. And so now it's in appeal. So Vitamix has had to post that $24.1 million bond, and it's just sitting there waiting for us, for the, for the judge to come back and to, on the appellate court, and to rule in our favor. And so it's a no-brainer when you've got the U USPTO, you've got the judge that already ruled validity and infringement, and then the jury willful infringement, and then the judge comes back and doubles it. So these folks, and I think they're in, in Costco right now, or they were last week, um, right now? Yeah. Anyhow, those folks, Vitamix, have taken a hundred, I'll say, this is safer to say, O over $52 million out of Orem, Utah, out of our economy. And fortunately, we're gonna get some back. But here they are, right in Costco in, in Orem, in our own town, um, taking money from our people that don't understand the difference. But anyhow, we're, clean, we're doing very well. We're also in Costco, Sam's, and BJ's, and that's one thing I was doing in England last week. And uh, anyhow, latest jar. This is a twister jar, latest invention. And this is so cool. When people see this work, their jaw just drops. This is for making hummus and nut butters. And you put a cup or two of, of, of almonds, dry almonds, no oil, and put it on the standard blender and turn it a little bit. It folds the nuts back in or the hummus 
and it makes nice and within 40 to 60 or 40 to 50 seconds you can pour the warm nut butters out of the jar also baby food and, and so on so this is the latest and the busiest smoothie shop in the world is in Penn Station New York mid Manhattan and they'll do 3,000 smoothies on a busy day and they're in the next two weeks are putting in the first hummus nut butter um, bar uh, in the world and you know how excited they are in England to be the first so yesterday I met with a group that's going to be the first ones in England and uh, to and England and Scotland to, to do the nut butter jar so that's one of the latest inventions but we have um, this is a home machine and standard this is what's sold in to to retail customers 3p horsepower we also have a and this is 13 amps we go up to 20 amps and so we have some very powerful machines we also have one that is um, we built a, a mega blender this is two feet by two feet with a I'm into power and <laughs> two feet by two feet by six feet high hundred pounds of uh, ice 120 pounds of ice and this is a machine that refrigerates bags six bags of product and you put a jar in it and and it puts the puree and everything else in you blend it you pour the the smoothie out or the coffee drink out then you stick it back in the machine and it rinses it and now you're ready for the next one McDonald's wanted that technology in 2005 and we wouldn't give it to them and so what they've done over the last five years is they've developed they got five companies to build two machines one's Manitowoc's name on it and one's one's a Taylor who makes the soft serve machines that's what you see in McDonald's and we obsoleted that machine six years ago for a new uh, and you can see this in some Mavericks and some um, um, some uh, 7-elevens but this is a machine that you take a cup this is a self-serve machine it makes its own pellet ice just like sonic ice puts it in a, a built-in jar that doesn't come out and it does it does a, a real blend it puts the puree and everything else in blends it and you just stick a cup in the cup spins out of sight and it does a beautiful job of, of blending it in 30 seconds brings it back around and you take the cup so this is the first and only self-serve um, smoothie machine in the world and so that's our latest and so we're so far ahead okay benefits and why why people would want to find a company to work for like Blendtec okay good let's uh, yeah I'll go back to the you can hear me better anyhow I had a, our marketing guy I finally hired a good marketing guy and he came up to me and he said he said what's my budget Tom I said you're the budget because we're an engineering company I said you got the money he said how about 50 bucks I said okay so he put my name on a lab coat and he bought a rotisserie chicken from Costco some marbles some rakes and and um, a six-pack of coke and we blended a bunch of stuff five we put up five videos and he came to me five days later and he said, we hit a home run. We have six million views on YouTube. And I said, who tube? <laughs> so this was five years ago. Who knew what YouTube was? Anyhow, I become their oldest. At 65, I'm their oldest celebrity on YouTube. And Google and YouTube fly us all around the, the country to uh, do things um, with them. And so it's been a great experience, quite a ride. Um, we've had we've had about a half a billion views on the internet and so that's why no matter where I go uh, you know whether I'm in China or where I'll be in a couple weeks uh, or Peru or or Estonia and that's one of my one of my favorite stories which I won't get into now <laughs> but anyhow people recognize me all over the world sometimes they look at me funny and I go like this and they say blender guy <laughs> you know and uh, so anyhow that's been a that's been a great marketing thing and so in fact I was in um, yesterday at, at Heathrow the guy right in front of me at the at the TSA um, guy uh, showing his passport and stuff he turned around and looked at me and I had a Blendtec coat on and uh, he said whoa Tom and uh, he said I'm I'm uh, Seth Godin's friend now Seth Godin wrote I think the fourth book about us there's 20 books now written um, any marketing class around the world no matter what language 
Um, they're all talking about and watching Will It Blends. And so this is, Seth Godin is one of the top, if you're into following marketing at all, he's one of the top people in the marketing. Uh, he's written more books and people follow him very carefully. And he's the one that he came along and said, I told you this was gonna happen. I told you someone was gonna do this. But this is the best thing in the world. It doesn't cost anything. In fact, people pay us to do, uh, they, they pay us um, sometimes $80,000 to do a Willet Blend. Now, what happens when we do this? I did one for Nike, I did one for Ford, uh, Nestle's with their dibs, and who's another one? Anyhow, um, and they actually pay us to do these. Now, oh, Olympus. I blended a, a point and shoot and a video camera and a voice recorder and all that for Olympus when they introduced the new pen. They introduced one 50 years ago and this is their new pen. So they had a million dollar prototype there that I, that I when I picked the blender up, just like Ch the Chuck Norris one, I picked the blender up and there's this beautiful um, camera. And then, um, anyhow, so that was one. But, but our fans get very upset because they say, you've sold your soul, Tom. What are you doing? You know, you, we're, gonna, we're gonna unsubscribe. I think we're up to about 450,000 subscribers now. I think it's like the 40 most subscribed to of all time on, on YouTube. But all these threats, but they, they continue to say, to stay subscribed. And what that means is that as soon as we put up a new video, which we'll do tomorrow. Now, what do you think we're gonna blend tomorrow? 4S. Yeah, 4S goes up tomorrow. Now the iPad has had has had um, about th uh, what 12 million now, and the iPad 2 with Steve Jobs in it. It's uh, filmed at the Sarah Theater, not really Steve Jobs, but um, fortunately he's still around. This our Steve Jobs, and uh, but he he uh, we did this at the Sarah Theater, and he's he's finally built something that that uh, can't be destroyed, and to prove it, he's gonna. Anyhow, it's a fun video. That's had probably two or three million views on the iPad 2. So, but yeah, tomorrow will be the 4S. And uh, it's nice to take something like that that everybody's interested in and blend it. My favorite one, <laughs> and people get really upset. And, uh, and finally, I did Justin Bieber. I waited till he was 17, though, because he was the number one. It used to be blend another blender. That was the most common requested thing. And then it was Justin Bieber by far. So I said, he's a nice kid, I'm not gonna do that. And of course, it's an action figure. And, uh, and then, uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty, it's probably hit a million or two right now. But um, finally, he's 17, I said, okay, I'll do it. You know, and, and the other one that we got in trouble over was Chuck Norris. <laughs> and uh, now Chuck, uh, and, and this is, you can still find it on YouTube, but he, and this is another little business story for you. But here I say, okay, Here's a, an action figure of Chuck Norris, and then here's all these bad guys. So I say the world's full of bad guys. They got guns and beards and everything. I take all the bad guys, throw them in a the blender, then I tie a string, a, a fish line around Chuck's neck, and put him in the blender, and, a, and it comes out through the top. And you can see the string. Um, and so there he is, and I'm blending. And of course, he's in the blender doing roundhouse kicks and stuff, you know. And then after a while, everything's gone, and, and I dump it out like this, and there's just a pile of rubble. And then on the end of the, the string, we put him back in there. And at the end of the string on a stick, we pull him out and he's dancing around, you know. And I said, oh boy, Chuck, I guess that total gym really works. And so we thought it was pretty cool. It got up, I don't know, five or six million views. And his attorneys contacted us. And they said, they said he gets three to $500,000 for a personal um, appearance. And so we want, we want $8,000 for writing this letter and for the attorneys, and we want $40,000 for the Kick Kid Foundation, Chuck's Kick Kid Foundation. And so we said, look, we'll take it down. We think he's benefited as much as we have, but, but we'll take it down. So we took it off YouTube, off our site. And then we got a letter about a month or so later, and now they want $16,000 and $80,000 for Chuck's Kick Kid Foundation. And then we sent them a CD, and this is a CD of Chuck being interviewed by a Dallas radio station saying that since his, his video came out, he's become so popular among kids that weren't even alive when he was famous. 
And so that was the end. We haven't heard a word since. <laughs> so what do we miss? Yeah, let's have some questions. Sure, we'll blend something, but do you have any questions first? <laughs> Besides, will it blend something? <laughs> any, any questions from anybody? Go ahead. What advice would you have for us uh, while getting a patent for something we're trying to patent? Okay, what, what advice do I have to someone who wants to patent something? You know, I get approached almost every day with some, some ideas, and most of them aren't good at all. And they really aren't. And we had one that hit a home run. In fact, I was so proud because I'm with my wife and we're in Pleasant Grove walking out of this business. And I, and I said, to, I ran into Dan and I said, Dan, how's the business? He said, you made me a millionaire. I sold out to, to um, Deloitte, not Deloitte, to uh, DeWalt. I sold out to DeWalt just like you told me to. He was going to give me one third of his business. And I said, no, I don't want any, I'll help you. I put him up, I hooked him up with some BYU engineers, electrical engineers, and I said, find somebody that can sell this thing that's got a, a name. He did that, he sold it for $13 million plus 6% of all the future stuff. That was a good idea. Um, I knew it would work. But other things, if you figure, we've put $4.4 million into fighting Vitamix. I believe that they put well over 10 to 12 million into trying to squish us. And so this is the David and Goliath thing. And we've been upfront and honest, and it's so important. You're gonna get in business, you're gonna get kicked around so much, and always do the right thing. Pe somebody's gotta do it to you, you know? And so don't, don't carry on these bad grudges and bad feelings. Just say thank you. In fact, my wife would say, Tom prays for challenges, and I get them. <laughs> and so I love adversity. I mean, I love it, just so I don't bring it on myself. If I do stupid things, or if I don't take care of my body, or I say things I shouldn't say, and it's not good. You want other people to do things to you. You don't want to cause your own problems. But back to your question, you know, it's almost impossible to protect yourself. If you don't have, the average right now I think is $3.8 million. If you don't have $3.8 million, then don't pursue any patent infringement. And if it's not a good idea, I did, I did my first patent on the mill, $1,000. And Tom Ciotti, who did that patent, he was an Alza patent attorney. I got so tired of, now most companies give you a buck, you know, when you sign up and they get the rights for the patent. They have to charge you something. Alza paid two dollars, but anyhow, I always get these things from my patents come across, and I'd, I'd read them and sign them. And, and Tom really appreciated that, Tom Ciotti. So he did my patent for a thousand dollars out of his house, but that's cheap. But then it cost me seven hundred thousand dollars later. I didn't tell you I spent another seven years in federal court because after Magic Mill went bankrupt. Someone else, they took the motor out of the mill, turned it vertical, and they made the Grain Master Whisper Mill. And that's still for sale right here in Orem. And I took them, there's 14 defendants, and they all went bankrupt. So the mistake that I made business-wise was I should have put a price of $99 on that mill. We would have zero competition today. So that was a major breakthrough. But patents, it's just risky. You think you got a great idea? You know, somebody else has already thought of it, most likely. And no matter how you whittle it down and how much money you have, you're going to spend a lot of your life in the, in the courtroom. Questions? Any more? We got, we're out of time for okay, questions. If you have any specific questions, stick around. Uh, we'll be here for a while. Two weeks ago, I got shot. We did five Willa blends in two hours. Now, keep in mind that my videographer said, we're not gonna do any, any more Willet blends, we're only gonna do real food things. And I'm sitting there, oh really, okay. He said, yeah, we're gonna do five more blends, then we're gonna do the iPhone 5, and then we're not gonna do any more blends. So I thought, that's interesting. That's not true, by the way, we're gonna keep doing this. <laughs> but anyhow, so we did these. Now, one that I did was, uh, I got shot. 
This is paintballs. They blended paintballs. And after that, I had my engineers, and notice I'm, if you watch this video, you'll see when the paintball hits this button and blows the button off. Now I had leather underneath and I had cardboard underneath that. And the only place that I got hit by one right here, and oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm still sore there from <laughs> a few weeks ago. Those puppies are real, <laughs> real uh, sticklers. But anyhow, I'm out of, um, I, I'm getting too fat. So this is my, la this is my last lab coat that, that fits me. My wife's making three more fat ones while I'm trying to lose weight. <laughs> and, and I gained 30, 30 pounds in the last, I think, five years or something like that. So I'm trying to get some weight off. But anyhow, so I'm, I'm, I was short lab coats. And I thought, this is the most valuable lab coat that I'll ever have, probably. Because I can sell this. You know the dust from the iPhone sold on eBay for $901 to a guy in Denmark? And, and the, the, from the iPad, iPod, sold for over $900 to a guy in Dallas, and we donate money to Primary Children's Hospital, and we mentioned that in the, in the, uh, on eBay, and this guy donated $5,000 to Primary Children's Hospital from Dallas, not knowing anything about the hospital in the, pat, in the prior. And so, anyhow, so we do, we do some fun things. Anyhow, here's... Uh, this is good advertising for latency. Everybody wants me to use their, their uh, stuff. And uh, they're building our new building. And they're also uh, they're the, one of the very best contractors in the state of Utah. Just built a million square foot building for the church up in Salt Lake. But OK, now, I've been on the Leno. How many of you saw me on the Leno show? OK. Yeah, 14 million people. I'm glad you weren't watching that. You shouldn't stay up that late. I've been on the Today Show, Katie Kirk, Charles Osgood, Dottie Deutsch. And uh, anyhow, I do a lot of, uh, <laughs> this is one of my favorite things to do because you can see, you can see what I'm doing. It's not like putting some little thing, unless someone's got an iPhone or an iPad, or I mean something. <laughs> now, I'm going to run this up. The tip speed is going to be 270 miles an hour. This is our small jar, and this is our home machine. But don't try this at home. All right, so I'm going to run it up. And smoke. Don't breathe this. <laughs> High fiber diet. <laughs> so if you want to get your picture taken after, come on up. You can hold a rake. We'll get our picture taken together. All right. <laughs> 